Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for um, joining us today. Um, my name is Benoli, and I'm joined by three of my other classmates, Joanna, Amy, and Julia. And together, we're going to kind of um, talk about our projects and tell some stories. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I'm, we're just kind of going to walk through the first thing of what we're going to do today. Um, so we're going to introduce what care is. Um, then we'll do a tiny exercise, um, after which we will tell stories um, and share our projects and do a little bit of um, reflection. And we will end with um, some questions, if there are any. Um, so, uh, what um, does care mean? Um, dictionary definition says it's to protect someone or something and provide the things that the person or thing needs. Um, but we kind of gathered our own definition of care um, from our projects. And for us, it's um, to see, to hear, and to act. Um, so we will do a tiny exercise now. Um, so we're gonna do the exercise on Miro. Um, the link to which should be on the chat. I've just added the link to the chat for everyone to access. Mm, I'm going to share my screen again. And for those who don't want to use Miro, they can use pen and paper. Um, but when you arrive on the Miro link, you will see this and there are four questions um, and there are tiny prompts below each question um, to help you guys kind of, um, yeah, help you guys fill up the question. Um, each question is kind of represented by one color um, and we've already placed sticky notes below, but if you do run out, out of it, um, there are four on top already that you can copy paste and put below. Um, you have kind of 10 minutes for it and Joanna is going to play some music for us for this. So I'm going to start. So yeah, your time starts now and 10 minutes and anyone can, yeah, people can use paper and pen as well, if not Miro. Um, does that sound okay? Yeah, you can use the thumbs up if you want or not. Um, okay, we're going to start. Joanna, we can't hear the music. You, you're mute, I think. Oh, wow. <laughs>
I'm going to read you the all human being. Um, yeah, I think the time is up. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for filling in the board. It looks really nice. Does anyone want to share what their thoughts on the exercise were? You can put it on the chat or kind of unmute yourself and talk. How did you guys find the exercise? Was it easy? Was it hard to do? If not, then we will just kind of move on to telling stories now. Um, I will reshare my screen. Um, and we're going to tell four stories today. Um, and I would encourage everyone to just kind of relax and close your eyes if you want to, or follow along if you're the kind of person who wants to read when someone's talking, um, then do that. And we're gonna start with Amy and she's gonna tell the story of Kate. Um, Amy, do you wanna go? Yeah, so I'm gonna tell Kate's story and Kate is one of the young people with learning disabilities that I worked with in my project. So when I was younger, I was involved in a terrible accident that left me with permanent brain damage. This changed the way I lived my life as I now needed assistance with a lot of things and my independence became limited. I went to school and college and ended up getting a diploma in retail. Through college, I was able to get a placement working in a local store, which was brilliant for gaining work experience and expanding my knowledge. 
However, at the end of the placement, I was denied a full time role. And I feel that this was because the store managers didn't know how to or weren't willing to learn how to best manage the needs of a person with a disability. Fortunately, after this experience, I found the Superstars Cafe where I've been working two days a week for the past seven years. Working in the cafe has been an incredibly positive experience for me, as it is a very safe environment where I'm able to work and learn without the pressure of feeling judged. I've also gained new skills thanks to Superstars. I now have a lot of baking and cake decorating knowledge, and this has become something I am passionate about. I've also grown in confidence in things such as working independently and serving customers. I'm really keen on having a career in baking and would love for employers to see the skills and abilities that I have rather than focusing on my disability. Um, thank you, Amy, that was nice. Um, I'm going to share the story of um, Bhavna, who is a homemaker in India. Um, and here it goes. The alarm rings sharp at seven. I wake up, gently opening my eyes to see the light that peeks through the small gap in the blinds. My eyes take a moment to adjust to the light, my mind to the beginning of a new day. I sit upright, placing my hands gently over my eyes and pray. I walk to the bathroom, brush my teeth while thinking about the neighbor passing that comment on my dress yesterday. Did she hate me that much? By the time I've finished brushing, I have thought about all the possibilities of why she might hate me. While in the shower, I continue to think about that comment, that thought taking me back to the time when my mother-in-law passed a similar comment 20 years ago. I walk out to the bathroom, slip into my clothes, thinking about how my mother-in-law once opened my wardrobe and kept it, kept it on display for whoever wanted to take any clothes in the family. I remember crying after that, tears that were covered with a smile for the family to see. I'm a nice person. I would want my family to borrow my clothes, but it's not about the clothes. It's about how I'm constantly made to feel how powerless I am in my own life. I'm a mattress on the floor that anyone can walk over. While walking to the kitchen, tears streamed down my face. The anger pulsing through my veins, my teeth clattering to contain the anger. I quickly removed the utensils to make breakfast, thinking about a time I had to walk in the heat while I was pregnant to fetch some vegetables because guests were coming over. I remember my mother-in-law telling me who else but I will go, that being pregnant does not render me useless. I remember crying that time, the tears dancing with the sweat dripping around my forehead. I remember the salesperson asking me if I was okay. At least he cared. Before I know, breakfast is made and so is lunch for my son. Most days this happens. I don't remember anything I do. It's also mechanical. After everyone has finished eating and my husband has left, I walk around the house in the same thought, whispering the things I wanted to tell all those people who did me wrong back then. All the things I couldn't say. My son sees me, but he knows I blabber just like this almost every week. My eyes unfocused. I know that I only get out of this if someone snaps a finger, but even that is momentary. I eat lunch while staring in the distance. Something is playing on the television, but I don't know what. I clean the utensils, but I don't know when. Before I know it, I have already made dinner. People have eaten and I'm on the bed again, staring at the ceiling, just like I did when I took an afternoon nap. I want to cry, but I can't. I'm angry, but don't know what to do. I want to love, but don't know how to ask. It's years and years of isolation that has caused me to be friends with the characters in my own head. No one thinks anything is wrong as long as food is being served, clothes are being washed, and things have been bought. The alarm rings at seven, and it's yet another day. But for me, it's one more day of existence. Julia? So did you know that 13,000 years ago in America, it exists a five meter tall sloth? And do you know what he ate? Wait, let's take a step back. Did you know that plants produce fruits as gifts to thank animals? This is really kind, but actually by eating them, animals will carry the seed of the plant around the world to make it grow and reproduce somewhere else. There are two ways to spread seeds. Some plants do not want to spend too much energy on creating delicious fruits for animals and decide to rely on water and air to spread their seeds, even if this approach has lower chances of generating new plants, because who knows where air or water will deposit that seed, maybe somewhere where it can't grow. On the other hand, uh, plants that make their seeds travel th through animals have a much higher probability of diffusion, but with higher energy costs, as I said, by creating very delicious gifts for animals. 
Let's think about it this way. Plants that want to survive must adapt their product, which is their fruit, to the market. There are animals by creating an actual business model, model canvas. Let's imagine a plant that thinks, who are my vectors, which means my customers, animals. What animals live in my area and why should they help me to disseminate my seeds? I have to find a way to convince them. And voila, plants had the brilliant idea of producing juicy, wonderful fruits and flowers to give to animals, including humans, to thank, to thank us for just supporting the seeds. Perfect, goal achieved. Yet, as with any other business, there are always risks involved. If your customers don't show up anymore, you need to update your marketing strategy as soon as possible to survive. And unfortunately, many plants and many businesses have failed to do, to do this. You know why? Because in order for a plant to survive, its customers, so its animals, can just eat the fruit to ensure the spread of the species. The seed has to actually pass through the animal's stomach without any damage. So let's stretch our imagination. Can you think of a vegetable whose seeds seem completely out of place and out of proportion for today's world? Exactly, the avocado is a great example. The avocado is originally from America. So what animal is able to expel a four centimeter seed without damaging it? Oh, that's why up to 13,000 years ago, it exists that giant slot, the size of today's elephants, because they were able to eat and expel avocado seeds. So the avocado was the producer and the slot the perfect customer. Yet when these animals became extinct, the avocado plant tried to sell its pro product to the jaguar, but this strategy didn't work very well. The avocado reproducing business wasn't growing at all, and actually it was losing market, market and its future seemed doomed. When all of a sudden, the Spanish arrived in America and they fortunately at least appreci appreciated the avocado fruit so much that today the avocado is in great demand all over the world. Uh, thank goodness, a uh, happy ending story. Oh no, unfortunately not. Um, relying on men was not a good move for the avocado. Like it wasn't a good strategy for bananas either. Yes, because people, people actually hate seizing food and genetically eliminate them. Easy. But when a plant no longer produces seeds, it becomes just a piece of the food industry that produces thousands of copies cloned from a single plant. And if a pest, a pest or a disease it's a plant, it can decimate each of its clones. Just think that in 2017 in England, packs of seedless avocados called cocktail avocados that can also be eaten with the peel were distributed uh, for the first time. And now our children will not even imagine that once the avocado had a seed inside it, just as we have never seen those of bananas. Thank you, Julia. Um, Joanna, you're next. The sweetest memory. After receiving a work permit, I started teaching English to immigrants to whom I always tried to cheer up and help as much as I could. For it is by giving that you receive. At church, I met a, I met a diverse community where immigrants and Americans were integrated and helped each other. I joined a Hispanic prayer group that has been like a family to us until today. We have shared Christmas, Thanksgiving, and many beautiful moments. In my family, life became simpler without luxuries, but more meaningful. Having less economic resources gave us the opportunity to realize that less means more. Many of the th things that I took for granted and thought I needed in the past, I do not need now. My sweetest memory in this country was when my father passed away and neighbors that I barely knew and seen before started sending flowers and food to my home. This helped me feel that I was not alone and that Americans are, th are there in the hardest moments of one's life. My husband and I have financially struggled, but we are certain that we are where we need to be. This is just his divine will. And yes, indeed, we are all the same. So we wanted to share these stories with you today because of course they're all relevant to our final major project, but mostly what they have in common, which is what brought us to this concept is that they are unheard voices. 
Through our research, we all confirmed how the protagonists of these stories continue to remain unheard, whether it's due to lack of education, misrepresentation in the media, or lack of understanding. In the next phase of this session, we will each be introducing how our interventions aim to give these unheard protagonists a voice, and we really hope you enjoy them. I will share my screen again. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Okay. Um, oops. Um, yeah, so my project is called Take Up Space. Um, and I'm going to start with why or how I kind of started to um, doing this project. So I was in India back in June and I had this conversation with my mom and we'd been like in isolation because of COVID for like five months. And I told her that it was really bothering me to like stay indoors for such a long time. And she said it was pretty normal for her and she didn't think anything was wrong. Um, so it kind of made me wonder why did she think it was so normal for her and like what are kind of the effects of um, isolation on women. Um, but like primarily I was kind of interested in knowing what is the impact of like caring on carers. Um, I kind of, we, I did some primary research and um, from that it was about, it started off with investigating in isolation, but I think it kind of opened up a window into issues of gender equality, patriarchy and primarily unpaid care work. Um, and uh, I was collaborating with Tara, who was doing a similar study in the UK, but on Indian immigrants. And together we kind of came up with some of the common insights, but some of them were kind of loss of um, self, loss of purpose, um, strife for perfection, um, kind of lack of confidence. Um, all of this kind of tied up to um, their duty and caring um, and kind of them not being valued for the work they did. Um, so from that, uh, we kind of came up with a statement of how do we kind of connect women together to kind of build their self-efficacy to help them find the abilities uh, and talents and to kind of like speak to uh, reinstill value in them. Um, so this was the intervention. Uh, it was a workshop that ran um, six weeks um, online, which connected women um, in India to women in the UK. And it was intergenerational um, where we met each other every week and exchanged skills and conversations uh, and topics kind of ranged from talking about arranged marriages to um, antibiotics to just kind of dancing online. Um, and each week we will have one facilitator who would present their talent or skill that they have and share it with the rest of the group. Um, I think what did kind what this intervention kind of did was um, increased women's self-efficacy and connection, but also kind of um, give older women um, tech literacy and improve interpersonal relationships. And daughters kind of started to see, kind of started seeing their mothers less as caring figures, more as someone who also needed caring. Um, and I think, yeah, um, but I think most importantly for me as a designer, kind of, it was interesting to see that just by listening, you can make a difference in someone's life and bring that voice out. So um, listening is kind of the key. Um, yeah, I would end with that. Um, thank you so much for listening. We have Julia who is next and she's gonna talk about her project on, it's called the Library of Vegetables. Yeah, Julia, yeah. go on. Thank you, Benali. So um, yeah, you can skip to the main, uh, slide, thank you. So with this um, with this project, I intended to encourage an emotional reconnection with nature through immersive storytelling. And the reason behind this choice is that now more than ever, we need to realize that our survival really depends on our relationship and cooperation with the natural world. So to rekindle uh, biophilia, biophilia in people, 
uh, in the summer of 2020, I needed to personally connect with nature to then recreate this affiliation in my final intervention. You can skip to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so um, yeah, to do so, uh, I lived on a remote island for weeks with marine biologists to protect dolphins and sea turtles from fishing interactions. I talked to uh, the locals and the fishermen of the Aeolian Islands in Sicily, and I found out about their intimate connection with biodiversity opposed to that of urbanized people. And one of the insights that I collected from this immersive and transformative experience is um, the powerful impact that stories told by them, by experts like biologists, but also, as I said, locals or fishermen, had on me to reconnect me spiritually and emotionally with nature. And for this reason, um, I, I turned storytelling into one of the key ingredients uh, of my intervention. Next slide. Um, this is what I did. I designed a more economically and physically accessible uh, immersive experience in nature, like the one I had, uh, by creating a podcast series about vegetables uh, that, if you think about it, are undervalued forms of nature surrounding us every day. Um, there, there, a second reason uh, why I choose vegetables as a theme of the podcast is because according to previous uh, research, primary research that I did, Vegetables are the most accessible meeting point between natural elements and millennials in Sicily, compared to parks, for example. So yeah, in the podcast, I have brought to light and adapted the point of view of many experts in different fields, uh, as you just heard. Um, some of the fields were mathematics, design, biology, art, and music to closely uh, link the discoveries, the experiences, the reflections of scientists and experts, experts to our everyday life and make science more interesting for, for us, for people. Um, can you, yeah. Uh, so yeah, to, to measure the impact of my intervention, I tested the experience in two variants with 20 millennials. The first group of people made of 10 millennials uh, received exclusively the podcast. Whereas the second one, still 10 millennials, received the podcast with the box of vegetables related to the stories to create a more immersive and physical experience and see if uh, this might have a higher impact in terms of behavior change. Um, but contrary to what I honestly expected, uh, those who received only the podcast show a higher behavior response, but also a higher increase in curiosity and connection with nature, as you can like quickly see from, from, the, from the chart, like with colors. Um, so yeah, you can go to the, to the last slide. Um, yeah, to sum up, uh, this experiment uh, showed me and proved that stories told by passionate experts can create in people, in people vivid scenarios without going through the physical and real experience and can trigger actions, reaction, both mentally and physically. And yeah, in this case, people, um, in this case, stories help people to uh, reevaluate nature and listen, listen to its unheard voices and vegetables are a great way, I think, to, to know how nature deeply designs each of its products and constantly works on evolving its methods and to improve the survival of each of each species. Here are some pictures of uh, like the visual representation of my podcast and the stories that I talked about. Thank you. Uh, I will now uh, let Joanna introduce her project and her experience. Thank you, Julia. Um, so we can move, dive into the first slide. Um, I spent the summer speaking to immigrants um, on a global level. As an immigrant myself, I knew I wanted to work with this community, community, community given, the back, given my background. I quickly noticed how the narrative in the media or the narrative, narrative in people's perception about immigration or immigrants didn't really match up to those that I was listening to in, these, in this group. So I decided to pursue this problem and create for this challenge. 
My, interve my intervention is called All the Same UK. It's a digital space created to celebrate and empower immigrants worldwide, to share stories of strength, resilience, and positive experiences to, to influence that constant negative chatter that surrounds us. The aim of this project was to liberate and challenge storytellers and story readers imagination and perception to remind them of their capacity for deep understanding and connection with other human beings. A reminder that despite where we, sorry, <laughs> despite where we might come from, look like or prefer in life, we are all the same. I will briefly be showing two prototypes that I ran through this project, which brings me to the next slide. After receiving a good amount of stories from immigrants around the world, I kept thinking of how I can make this experience shared in a tangible way and not just digitally. I felt that due to the pandemic and the constant negative chatter that surrounded us last summer, adding these stories into someone's path during the day would be worth analyzing and would also be a positive contribution to my community. So when I analyzed this prototype um, and the responses around East London, which is where I live, Insights portrayed empathy and support arose. These stories enabled engaged users, engaged readers to connect with the immigrant struggles and challenges, particularly, particularly with family separation. Readers could be assumed to have been cognizant of the things that made life worthwhile, but which they might have taken for granted, such as being around their loved ones. There was an evident interest in stopping reading and empathizing with these stories and said community, which meant I was one step for, further towards creating a solution for this challenge. Um, next slide, please. Which brings me to um, perception sessions. Um, I wanted to kind of dig deeper as to what this impact was creating um, in these stories and how I could use them to influence perception just a little bit through positive storytelling. Um, so I created a digital workshop um, that was meant to challenge perception, broaden horizons, increase education, and prompt self-reflection. I invited a group of non-immigrants to sit down and wear the shoes of these stories and of these storytellers. Three personal stories were shared during each workshop, and these stories elicited empathy from the participants. The exercise's subconscious objective was to share the stories and prompt, even if it was for just one second, empathy and understanding from that storyteller's point of view. Due to the nature of the exercise, I was able to allow, to invite the participants for the first time to wear somebody else's shoes. And, and, one, and they all wondered what it must have been like to endure prejudice amongst other things. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. I'm going to introduce you to Amy, who will be talking about her superstars journey. Hi, so I was creating a CV scheme in a local business near me called Superstars, which is a social enterprise that um, they take on young people with learning disabilities and teach them skills for employment um, so they can then move into other jobs. And so I was inspired to do this project as my own younger brother um, has autism and he's currently 15 and in a few years time I know he wants to work. But at the moment here in Northern Ireland, um, we have the highest disability employment gap in the whole of the UK at 45.2%. And as well as that, that largely includes people with things like physical disabilities. It's predicted that people with learning disabilities are only employed at a rate of about 6%, which is really shocking. So I was really lucky to be invited into the Superstars Cafe to actually work as a volunteer. And so I got to go um, about twice a week. And this was such a real, it was such a good experience because I really got to know each of the people with learning disabilities on an individual basis. And I got to know their needs. And this really allowed me to take a person-centered approach in, in my intervention and tailor it to all of their needs. And through this and also conducting interviews and focus groups with the young people, I was able to find out some of the following, which were that they, um, they had a feeling that people were focusing on their disability and they weren't um, seeing the abilities that they had that they could take into the workplace. And as well as this, they also struggled to articulate the abilities they had, like they might know personally that they're really good at doing certain tasks and had some skills, but they'd really struggle to tell this to people. So that provided a barrier in talking to employers. And um, there was also a need in the cafe to track the progress 
of the young people um, as they currently didn't have a way of monitoring the skills and that they were developing. Um, so next slide, please. So the interview, the intervention was a CV scheme that involved a booklet, which was then used to create a CV in the end. Um, I was kind of surprised that the CV in this project ended up not being the main focus. Instead, the booklet was the primary focus as this was used to actually track the progress of the young people and um, to record all the skills and then develop the CVs. Um, so the booklet was created as a result of two things. Firstly, I completed um, LinkedIn's um, CV masterclass, which taught me some skills about how to create CVs. And this gave me some really interesting insights into what to put into the CV. Um, mainly this, the most interesting thing I thought was it told me to include testimonials from employers and colleagues to um, really show off what they felt was the, the main skills that these people had. Um, and then as well as this, I did some prototyping at home to develop how the booklet and CV will look. So the booklet is divided into three sections. Firstly, a personal profile where the young people can record their, their basic information, their um, qualifications and education, everything you'd expect to find on the CV. And then the next two sections are created for the their mentors in the Superstars Cafe to fill out. So the first of this was these was about their skills and tasks and um, it it included a list of tasks that they would um, complete in the cafe and then their mentor could mark them off and discuss the skills that they'd learned from this. And then the third section was about references and testimonials, which again was inspired by the um, CV masterclass that I completed. So their colleagues in the cafe could write some um, phrases and words about them. And this was a really good confidence booster for the young people as they got to see what, how their colleagues felt about the skills that they had and the work they'd been doing in the cafe. And also this was really nice as it acted as a collaboration between um, the staff and the young people in the cafe. And so this information was then turned into personalized CVs which focus on the skills that they'd learned and um, also the, their colleagues perception of them. So overall, from this, the staff said that they could see clear growth in the trainees' um, confidence compared to at the beginning of the project when they really struggled to articulate the skills that they had. Um, and they also really enjoyed being part of something that was specifically designed for them and tailored to their needs. Um, so the, the booklet and the CV also both made clear what the trainee was good at to themselves as well as to employers, which was it was a really interesting part of the project because whenever I initially came into it, I was just thinking about um, how employers might perceive the, um, the young people with disabilities instead of thinking about um, how they actually perceive themselves. So it was really nice to be able to have this change in um, helping the young people to articulate what they were good at and to grow their confidence and feel good in their skills that they could then take on for future employment. Um, and also it, it was really useful for the staff in the cafe as it allowed them to track their progress and see the development in their skills that they had in their time in the cafe. And even better, superstars have now decided that they're going to actually implement this into their business in the future, which I'm really happy about. Um, so thank you for listening. And now we're going to invite you to take some time to reflect on the interventions that we have just shown you and also the questions we asked you at the beginning. And um, is there any other voices you can think of that are unheard? And um, just feel free to write in the chat any reflections that you have. Also, we invite you to think about our projects and how it could relate to any unheard voices that you might know of. Yeah, and if there are any questions, please do pop it in the chat or unmute yourself and do ask us. Um, Thank you so much for listening. I'm gonna stop sharing.
So it looks like we're jumping into Q&A. Do we want to start answering these questions? Mm -hmm. So let's start with Shilag. What do you all plan to do with your projects and the learning they've created for you? Who wants to take this one, Grouse? I can go. go ahead. Yeah, so, um, so my project again was about um, emotional reconnection with nature and the way I want to maintain it, like I want to pursue my research uh, into the science field with bi biodiversity and wildlife conservation, but I want to maintain and keep this um, communication, um, like I, I think science really needs to be communicated and explored way more instead of just feeling like too hard or too boring and i really want to combine these two fields like arts and science and so yeah this is how i i plan to to keep going i mean you were saying something me i thought i thought you were oh yeah uh, i can answer the question as well um yeah i still plan on working with the superstars cafe um even after the project's finished there were some um some little points in the booklet and things that weren't like 100% right. So they want to develop those further and they discussed creating a second booklet as well for, um, for people with learning disabilities that might be have a lower level of ability and might need more things like visual prompts and stuff like that. So we want to expand the scheme to be more inclusive for everyone. Great, so Alice has another question. Um, Benoli, you might be good to answer this one. How did we come to the decision of what is care as a collective? Um, so for us, we were kind of like talking about our projects and everything. We kind of came to this conclusion that how empathy is kind of different than care in a way that empathy is when you kind of look at something, but you don't or not necessarily do anything about it. You just feel it. But with care and with our projects, we really acted on it. And for us, we believe that the first step is to see, but also to act. Um, so that's how we kind of came with the yeah uh, idea of care as a collective. I hope that answers your question, Alice. Cool. Rebecca has a very relevant question, which I think we all experienced and is, was it hard to stay empathetic during an emotionally draining time? I can say that, yeah, it was hard as for everybody, but like really connecting with nature was the most powerful thing. It really helped me just looking at a tree for hours <laughs> or hugging a tree. This really, this still helps. So I really I highly suggest. Um, for me, I'd say that actually my project was part of like my week that would be one of the, it was one of the nicest parts of my week. So the rest of the week would be quite emotionally draining, but then actually getting to go into the cafe and be in this really lovely community that it just had such a nice environment and it was such a nice safe space. Like it really made me forget about all the rubbish going on in the world at the moment. So it was actually, yeah, it was a nice little escape from everything going on at the moment. I agree. I also think for me, um, the fact that I had to see empathy, I would basically make my empathetic muscles stronger every day. And every day, maybe it was a harder day to wake up or we had more lockdown rules, et cetera, but I had this project that needed me to be okay. So that allowed for you to keep moving forward as well. I think for me, like it kind of gave me the sense of solidarity in a way that like it helped me connect with other people and like feel in these times that we're all in this together, even though we were like, yeah, like apart, like world apart, like, yeah. So yeah, it was hard, but I think it was also nice to empathize. Cool. So Dara wants to know how we were able to develop new relationships and build trust during the pandemic with it being um, online and physically distanced. I think it was easier than expected because we were all in this together. So 
uh, like my participant really loved connecting with me and with new experience and something that was just pure joy and happiness. So yeah, th actually this really helped, I would say. Yeah, I think people also had a lot of time at hand to like kind of connect and like talk and take the time out to talk. Um, so yeah, it was kind of what Julia said. But I think we all had that worry at the beginning so that is like a fair worry to have, like how am I gonna make this a tangible project? And, and because we're in a pandemic, but it actually turns out that you're more able to create community because people were actually actively looking to be in communities and be part of something. Absolutely. I love the way you've considered the evaluation of your interventions. How did you decide what to measure? Mm. Um, so this is a really nice question because it took a while for me to understand and yeah basically what I did is I initially tested my intervention like my podcast I recorded with them like they were they sounded really like not really professional but I still tested them and I found out that people were curious I had no idea that curiosity could could have been one of my key like measures so from my early exp like experiments, I found out what things were changing from before and after. This was really helpful. Yeah, I agree. My, my journey was a little bit similar. Sorry, I skipped someone's question. It said, how to face those people who are ignorant about environment, especially my Asian parents, LOL. Um, I'd love to chime in here. I think um, I, I can't is enough empathy you have to we have to understand that not everybody has the level of education that we do and if you um receive and understand it and, and and you look at those people with empathy it doesn't really affect you that much um i think as an immigrant i, I experienced a lot of you know i'd be on forums and and how they would bash that community and i was always understanding that this is why i'm here to solve this problem right so it's a lack of education and i'm going to create for this problem so when you see it from that point of view it was very easy and it's almost empowering because it gives you a reason to move forward because you're like i i can solve this and also change takes time and it's normal and okay people need time to change perspectives and like consider like new opinions. So it's normal that, that it takes time. That it feels like it never happens, but it's still happening. Would you go as far as saying that inequalities of wealth have become inequalities of health and care in society? If so, how did this vary on each of the topics and communities around the projects? qualities of wealth have become minimal. I would say in my project that um, like the, the cafe I was working in, it um, was completely unfunded. Like all the money they made there was put into funding the cafe. It was done through donations from um, just people that come in and family members of people that work there and charity. And so, um, I think that like the learning disability com community is like, it's really left behind. They really are unheard voices because they really are being forgotten about in funding. And um, also in my own experiences, just with my younger brother, like I've noticed that um, when it comes to learning disability groups and things, like there's a lot that are targeted for children, but once you get to adulthood um, and I suppose teenage years as well, you start, there starts being less. Um, and I think even just looking at um, charity events and stuff like you always per, um, perceive people with learning disabilities as like young children and stuff like that, or at least that's kind of like the face of it. So um, older people with disabilities kind of are left behind and the funding does become less and less for them. Um, so that's something I really wanted to approach in my project um, to try and create these opportunities and bridge that gap. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but... Um, that's my take on it. <laughs>
That's great, Amy. Um, did the urgencies and practices of feminism and feminization inform your thinking, feeling, and action? I think, yeah, for like, for my particular project, it did, but I think it was also kind of, for me, it was really interesting to see that you literally had to like experience it yourself to, to know how it feels like to be a homemaker. Like shouting, them shouting didn't exactly help, but just you being there kind of like did the job of everyone sort of started, starting, starting to notice all these things. Um, so yeah, I think for me, it was kind of interesting to see this, um, yeah, the practice of feminism with like experiencing it myself and like understanding everything together. Okay, I think we have about three minutes left if we want to do any other questions, last questions or comments or reflections. Silence. <laughs> Yeah, we're very grateful for everybody that joined. Um, how do you feel now that you have finished your projects? I think we're all very happy. I'm not gonna speak for all of us, but I know I'm particularly very happy. I'm very happy with the outcome and what I've learned throughout this whole MA. Benoli? Yeah, I think, I think it's the same for me, but it's also this feeling of like, what should I do with my time now since I, yeah, I had so much to do with the project, but now there's literally nothing to do. So yeah, there's this that thing of that. But yeah, it's been, I think it's been a great journey overall. Julia, do you want to say something to that? Yeah, and the good thing, yeah, yeah, and the good thing is that to to me at least, a project never finished uh finishes properly. So we still have time to like to, to keep working on that. And I think we're really passionate about this idea. So let's see. Amy, do you want to say any last words? We're about to sign off. Uh, no, um, it's it's really nice to have it finished. It really is. <laughs> but it is also kind of like staring into like a void of, of nothingness as well. Like it's just suddenly done. Um, but yeah, I do keep reflecting on it and thinking like, oh, I want to do this now. I want to take it further in this way or I wish I'd got this done. So even though the project is finished, it's kind of not finished as well. Exactly, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your very kind comments and we appreciate you and we hope it was very insightful and that you all took something home with you today. Yeah, thank you so much. I really love your initial descriptions and perceptions on, on our exercise also. Great energy, great group of energy. Yeah. So much, everyone. Thank you, thank you so much.